Welcome to Startup Stories, where we go behind the scenes of some of the most interesting and innovative tech startups in the world. Each episode will bring you in-depth interviews with entrepreneurs and business leaders, sharing their personal stories on success, failure, and everything in between. So whether you're an entrepreneur yourself or someone that's just generally interested in the world of startups, then Startup Stories is the perfect place for you to gain insight and inspiration into some of the most exciting players in the game. So sit back, relax, and join us on a journey of Startup Stories. Peter, welcome to the Startup Stories podcast. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. So there's going to be some people that don't know who you are. So for the listeners... Could you give them a brief introduction? Yes, of course. So I'm, I'm Peter. I'm, I'm from Germany. Uh, I'm originally a developer, how I, I would say. Uh, so I um, was doing software development also in parallel to my, to my studies. Uh, projects became bigger. Uh, so I founded my first, uh, first company out of university. It was a software development company. Uh, but over, over time, I thought, OK, so I also want to do more. And especially also uh, kind of like got uh, into this uh, entrepreneurial uh, mindset. So um, like starting companies uh, is a lot of fun working with with the people that you uh, that you like uh, bring them in and uh, build great products uh, so i um, decided to move to berlin eight years ago joined the company builder and this company builder happened to build um, fintech startups um, in, in focus so that was my segue into the finance world so where i never thought i would ever end up so especially during university times um, so when we had like economic topics um, i would i would say that's what this was not my my favorite because it was uh, not much technical but um, but yeah so things change in, in your life so I got into the finance industry um, and was able to um, to join Solaris Bank in, in the founding team um, so we, we built up a, a bank from the scratch and this was the first fintech startup getting a banking license in, in Germany um, and I was their CTO for the first three and a half years, but also got into the crypto and blockchain uh, ecosystem pretty early. Also, just from from this idea, kind of um, so if you, people can hold their bank in the pocket, so why are we still working on the bank? So what's what's it all about, and what we can do with it um, from inside a bank? Um, so so this was my my research theory, but I I really fell into the rabbit hole and uh, wanted to work full time in it. Um, and long story short, uh, then uh, build up a, a kind of a digital asset trading um, exchange um, for for Börse Stuttgart, which is a like regional stock exchange from from Germany. And for the past two years, we're building up Unstoppable Finance with our product Ultimate, and we want to bring DeFi to the masses. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, you know, looking at your your resume on LinkedIn, you've had quite the quite the experience with uh, different startups that you've been, as you mentioned, the founding partner of, which is really interesting. But so that's why I want to sort of unwire all of uh, your journey and uh, understand why you became who you have come today. So, can you think back to your earliest memory from your childhood what what comes to mind so my my whole family also was like uh, were entrepreneurs so starting with my with my grandfather which i uh, actually never never met so like with really with like a like a conscious mind so this uh, must have been before i was uh, 3 years old uh, but he was already um, running like uh, different companies in the in the logistics industry and uh, so my uh, my father and um, his uh, brothers also got in, into like entrepreneurship very early and so i think this uh, at least uh, gave me some some influence from from the very early days and whereabouts did you grow up i i grew up in uh, like near dusseldorf um, which is a city in, in western germany okay what was life like there um life uh, was was pretty good i would say um the city I, I grew up in it's like a like a tiny town with uh, fifty thousand citizens, but um, kind of very close to the um, to the very uh, populated areas in, in northern Westphalia, kind of in, in in western Germany. So it was uh, kind of like on the on the land side, so that you had kind of like the benefits of the land side. Um, but at the same time, you were able to uh, be like in Düsseldorf uh, city center in 10 minutes, in Cologne, like in half an hour, uh, and in this uh, Ruhr area, kind of like this, the, the biggest, um, the biggest kind of like concentration of cities in, in Germany that was also only about like 10, 15 minutes um, by car. So uh, it was a pretty, pretty good 
pretty good um, area to to grow up because you kind of had both. So you had kind of the whatever like uh, like the, the sweetness of um, of living on the land. But um, so if you wanted to have city life, you could go to the city. Yeah, that's a nice little benefit having both of them. How would you how would you describe yourself as a child? Well, I think as a as a, as a child, I was very very calm. Yeah, very very silent. So I. Uh, Kind of um, when people were talking to me, I turned like red, like a like a traffic light in, in my <laughs> in my head, uh, and uh, didn't uh, didn't talk much and uh, kind of like very yeah a very very silent and and shy kid. But uh, over time, I learned kind of to to open up. Okay, did throughout your life, can you think, especially in your younger days, can you think of any uh, big influences that? Uh, whether that's a person or a situation or a moment in your life. So I was always pretty curious and um, I was reading a lot of books, uh, but um, not uh, kind of uh, kind of like um, no, no story books. Um, it was more about like uh, the books to learn something, whatever about history and about technology and, and so on. And uh, my, my parents were pretty open to kind of like say, um, so I had like, I, I got like very, very little pocket money, um, but so I, I kind of like if I wanted to have a book that was kind of like always, always for free. Um, and, and therefore, I really took took the benefit from like reading a lot of stuff and uh, knowing about a lot of stuff. And I was always interested in exploring. And um, when uh, I got into the into into the high school, like at the fifth grade, we um, so I, I came into a class where um, people already had uh, computers yeah that there were like two people already having a, a, a pc um kind of like in the very early days and um, so what what year this must have been so i think this must have been like around uh, around 1990 or 1989 or something um so so this was pretty pretty early so um kind of like after the first year anyone of the of the of the boys had a had a computer somewhere like in in reach and we were like deconstructing and uh, gaming and and so on and i think this influence um was like was very important also to take this direction into like information technology and learning to code and um, kind of like growing up with a computer at, at those days has definitely not been kind of the normal mm -hmm. can uh, when did your interest for finance and entrepreneurship come into your life yes yeah, so I, I think for me it uh, it came kind of uh, it, it came like in, in baby steps uh, but like in a continuous way um, so like i mentioned i, I got uh, like a very very little pocket money so which means that um, especially when uh, you get like uh, like in the teenager ages and you, whatever you want to buy something i had to start working very very early and whatever uh, delivering the newspapers and um, so I worked in like a in an auction house kind of like presenting the the, the pictures and um, uh, and helping like with administrative stuff there and uh, gave like math um, math teaching and uh, and whatever teaching people uh, music instruments and so on so I was like always very active in in finding ways to 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 finance myself and um, and I think this over time then kind of like when when coding came into the life then whatever you talk to people hey um i do coding and then people tell you hey we need something um, can you build us whatever a database for something and then you kind of develop yourself into into kind of doing doing that stuff and uh, so i never had a plan kind of so in three years i want to be an entrepreneur and uh, run my own business i kind of it, it happened through these all these mm -hmm. baby steps that I got into the situation and uh, maybe the, the the main influence uh, where I definitely would would say that it had had an impact was simply that um, kind of that there was a need yeah so I uh, I wanted whatever to buy something um, I bought my my first electric guitar um, with money that I earned myself and uh, that's uh, also like that electric guitar I still own it and uh, it's still fun because I know that there was like my sweat uh, flowing into it so that I was able to buy it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see entrepreneurship all around us every single day, but not everybody is influenced by it and more so want to pursue it. But what was it about the idea of entrepreneurship that got you hooked to the point where you actually wanted to pursue it? 
Well, so so I think there there was um, like I described in the very early days, simply the demand. Yeah. So I, um, if you um, if you want to buy something and you don't have the money, there's like two options: you you can steal, um, or you um, or you can uh, kind of like get the money from from somewhere and, and earn it. Uh, and I took the second uh, second um, second option, um, and um, so it became for me totally natural to to work like in a in a freelance way and to kind of um, have jobs and um, take a responsibility to to find jobs and uh, and and so on and uh, and also be creative like um, so I taught myself guitar and um, I wouldn't say that I was like the uh, John Frusciant <laughs> kind of uh, the, the the best player in the world but if you're like already a little bit better than kind of the people you teach you, you can give lessons right so this is like you, you can share the knowledge and um, and uh, and kind of earn a little bit um, uh, on top from from that and, and that was uh, exactly what 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 was happening and uh, and in the end this, this kind of like continued like then you, you do coding and there's other people who can't code or all right so you can help them you can build something for them and so um, through all my my, my studies, uh, kind of the the projects became bigger, and and then, um, of course, I wanted to to work on those bigger projects, but I needed to have helping hands with me. Like I needed to build a team around me, um, that led into the into the first founding. Can you remember whether it's whether it's successful or not? Can you remember your very first business idea, and what was it? Well, so so well, the, the the one that I just described um, was simply like doing doing services. So we we were kind of like coding coding for money. So we we help people to build to to build their digital products. Like in the like it was around two thousand two thousand eight when we when we founded the first company. And um, and in the end, uh, yeah. So it's, so it was uh, it was bootstrapped, um, which definitely also brings its own impacts and uh, it's also kind of a very interesting experience in, in the beginning of a, of a career to, to bootstrap something um, can elaborate on that also a little bit later um, but yeah so so first business ideas so I think there there was like um, all the time there have been like ideas around me so that uh, that I wrote into my idea book that uh, I like most of them I, I didn't build but the one I had very early and where I was a little bit sad uh, afterwards that I was not building it was um, building a password safe because um so this uh, as when we uh, when we worked in this um, in the software development company um we've seen like a lot of clients and and people around us who were struggling like whatever with hey so can you send me the the database password and then people were sending this via email or sms or whatever and like especially whatever 15 years ago or 20 years ago people did not care like about security this was just like yes of course i can tell you here this is like on my uh, note <laughs> like that i that i uh, put on my on my screen or something like that so that there was uh, kind of like uh, and we thought like this is not right yeah so like passwords are, are secret yeah and they need to be treated in a secret way uh, and you need to rotate them and you need to develop like certain process around that and um, so i thought hey so to have like a team password safe that would be a great idea and i think whatever three years later there were one password and last pass and, and all these all these companies and uh, but i think so like well but what's the what's the gist so the, the gist is i i always had ideas that were around solving a problem and um and that is it's kind of like so people don't share passwords like uh, like in, in, the, in the right way and this causes risk okay so there's like a solution for that problem and Kind of uh, like many many things that I discovered over over the past over the past twenty years uh, followed that that analogy. Kind of is there a problem? Yes. Okay, let's solve it. And if you solve it and it's worth something, then people will pay for that. What were the biggest lessons that you learned from your first business idea? Then with this password safe, I think very it's it's very very important. Of course, like ideas are nothing. Yeah. So do you um, kind of like you can you can be proud about like having ideas, but um, so building them and really bringing them to market. So that's um, that's the that's the main the main thing. So the the only thing that that counts. And from my from my first founding, um, I think like the the positive lesson was uh, that I. Um, Kind of like really to bootstrap something is is like a very interesting way to build something up because it really forces you to be profitable and kind of like you 
are very very close to your business and uh, to product market fit and uh, so it's, it's way different compared to um, being financed by investors and whatever kind of uh, which require you to have product market fit in three years and whatever so this like like bootstrapping is, is a very very nice nice founding experience kind of to to really learn it the hard way and also kind of like whatever not paying your salary and just like being very 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 <laughs> very close to the to the edge and just uh saying like okay so i really believe in that we continue and then kind of uh, it turns out you you get the revenues and and build up the company and and uh, things are working so it's like a very very nice very very nice feeling um maybe on on the downside i think um what i what i learned from uh, from from my first project is really um you need to have a balanced founding team and um so this uh, this, this was uh, mainly the the reason why i also decided to to move on that uh, I didn't have the impression that um, that uh, that uh, kind of like me and my co-founder were uh, kind of like married forever. Yeah. So this this work like it hmm. was it was it was possible to to bring in to bring up this uh, this this company and uh, make it work. Um, but uh, in the end, there like. Uh, after after a few years, I, I realized that the founder fit was not given, uh, and uh, that I um, was like more and more frustrated about that. And uh, so I, then I decided, okay, so even um, think for like getting the the first employees and getting the the first projects, building the first projects, and so on. I had a very very big. Uh, chunk kind of like of, of, of making it work um, and therefore still like even like decades after people still talk to me like hey you founded this oh wow so we we we, we know it and uh, whatever people invite me to give speeches about, about that um, so still I'm, even like years ago I'm 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 still recognized as, as kind of like the core force behind it but uh, but yeah so it was uh, so it really taught me like okay so you you need to work on the founder fit and you also kind of you you need to figure it out in, in the beginning but also you need to work on it like continuously so that uh, you learn to bring up difficult topics from the very beginning and that you're able to talk about that it's a little bit like like a marriage yeah so uh, if you don't learn to talk about the hard things uh, you potentially don't get happy like forever absolutely and um with regards to your mindset and the way you speak about entrepreneurship, as you always say, it's about for you, it's about solving a problem, always has been. Where did you get this mindset from? Or was it like what you said, baby steps? Or was there someone that gave you, you know, had the biggest influence on you to think this way or learn this way? Well, I, I think I, I would, so like many, many things that, um, that I also describe and, and talk about I mostly found out by myself I, I would say kind of that uh, so I, I always reflect what's what's going on and what's kind of like working and and, and so on um, so this uh, this kind of like like many many things kind of like develop like grow in, inside of me and um, and become kind of uh, uh, outspoken for me when when I really re realized kind of like that uh, that these these theories um, work in a way um, maybe the and, and therefore, so also I don't read much whatever business books and uh, and and so on or whatever uh, books of uh, famous founders and so on and so forth. So this is like a little bit, little bit boring. Um, so I think you you get like the mm -hmm. the the interesting aspects anyway from from somewhere. Um, but yeah, so I I don't have idols. And um, so if the if the maybe the, the the biggest influence that 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 I got um also when reading such such a such a business book um was uh, the lean startup um by eric rees um it's because kind of like this really hit hit the nail for me um also kind of when it comes like product market fit and um to how to build up a, a company and do like be very pragmatic in the beginning and and test uh, test your theories with the market and so on so i think this this really was was enlightening to me, um, but other than that, I I, I don't really remember um, uh, books that I read that kind of got me got me to the next level. So I'm really interested to try and understand how you think, Peter. So you know, I, I can go off how I think, but maybe you think slightly differently. So you know, you was at your previous. I'm looking at your previous work and then all of a sudden in April 2021, it says that you, you started Unstoppable Finance, right? So 
when it comes to like ideas, for example, so if I, if I was thinking from my perspective, you know, I'm always thinking of ideas and then it just, there's a certain thought process that you have where you think, you know what, this one can actually work. Let's turn this one to reality. So I'm curious to, to get inside your head when you're, I mean, you sound like someone that's always thinking of ideas how do you decide that out of all the ideas that you're constantly thinking about that this is the one this this can work this can happen talk to me about that how that how that comes into fruition um yeah so in, in, in the situation with um with unstoppable finance and start building ultimate this was really um seeing seeing decentralized finance to become a, fly, a flywheel like uh, two years, two and a half, three years ago. And um, so, as I, as I mentioned, I, I got into the blockchain space pretty early, like uh, around 2016. Um, and um, kind of especially when you, when you, it was like before the hype and um, and so kind of like you, you get the theory and you build up your mind kind of like where things might move. And I was uh, constantly thinking on how could like a different finance system look like yeah so like a maybe like with fewer intermediaries with uh, maybe still banks involved but in different roles and uh, like new technology introduced and um, i'm also constantly talking about kind of like the internet of money yeah so so where the, where is it so we have um, like a global information system with the internet where we can uh, access information globally for for the past 30 years but we don't have a finance system that works the way. So like the like making a transaction usually stops like at the borders of Europe and then you need to have like swift correspondence bank systems or PayPal or like other um, other intermediary solutions. But um, so we don't have like something comparable to the internet for, for, the, for the finance world. And um, with um, pub public permissionless blockchains, um, I kind of found for myself the first technical implementation that could bring us to, to, to this level so that we're able to, to wire transactions globally uh, in a way where kind of so also comparable to the internet like the internet is not owned by anyone yeah so you could say there's maybe different companies and associations owning certain parts of it whatever like i can the, the the domains and there's like whatever the router producers uh, and there's whatever the uh, web server producers and so on but still kind of like the internet is not owned by anyone it's like a set of open standards and um, so that's what from my point of view what we also need for for the finance world um, so that um, people can transact like in in in, in the network like uh, on, a, on a free basis like without asking anyone for permission and if somebody offers a financial service to somebody this is offered by a company by a DAO or by a certain certain group of people um, in a specific technical way and, and this is kind of like what what I discovered for myself for um, like in the very in a very very early time and when we realized that um, like with MakerDAO, with Uniswap, and, and all these all these projects, um, that it became reality that people were building on top of permissionless blockchains, financial service solutions that you would like find on other ways, like also in the traditional finance uh, finance space, but it, like in a much more automated way, in a much more technical way, in a much more global way. Um, we were thinking like, hey, so this is so this is the time now also to um, to get involved in in the space um, and. Uh, in consequence, we uh, we quit our jobs at um, at the stock exchange where at the stock exchange company where we we're working at Börse Stuttgart, and um, and decided to build up Unstoppable Finance from the scratch. And especially um, when looking at the crypto space, it has always been like very 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 niche. Yeah, so the, the very very technical and especially the DeFi world. Like if you go on a website, the day to day mass user doesn't understand the word yeah so because it's it's like very very niche to to these to these people who really know how this works and who really like anticipate what others are doing and um, so we wanted to make it much more easy and uh, and therefore decided to to build kind of like a like a front end to access this whole new world um that we that we offer to kind of uh, anyone and especially also to to mass audience people yeah, and this was this was kind of our, our first start, um, and um, a couple of a couple of months or a couple of weeks ago, we um, then made like a second announcement that we're going to start a second company now, and um, the the reasoning behind it is also 
we want to bring DeFi and decentralized finance to the masses. And uh, from, from our point of view, there is one very interesting development now um, coming coming towards us. This is um, like with the Mika regulation in, in Europe, um, there is like a common rules that introduced not only for crypto services, but also for um, issuing stable coins. And, um, and stable coin, from my point of view, is a very fascinating product because it combines let's say the best of both worlds so there's like the the let's say stable value of a of a governmental currency like the euro or like us dollar but it's tokenized so it's kind of uh, brought on on the blockchain so that you can wire it on the blockchain in real time in a global way um, and you can build uh, build um, on top of that, you can you can code it, you can use it in DeFi, you can make it programmable, and um, so we also with our experience, like in building up a bank, building up a, a asset trading um, MTF in, in Germany. So we're pretty familiar also with this regulated world. So we said, okay, so let's um, use this let's uh, use the opportunity and build up another company and uh, found found the bank again. So you started the company in 2021. What does a startup need to do right in order to make sure they have a successful start? So it starts with the founder fit. So like I mentioned earlier, so you need to have like a very, uh, very um, balanced group of people. Also, of course, um, as as broad as possible, also that we, that you can cover all the different topics that you, that you need from the very beginning. So you don't want to step on on each other's uh, feet um, when you when you start building something up, and um, you. I think you need to have an ability to hire the, the right people for for your team. And um, so to, to me, also when, when looking back to, to all the companies that built up so far, um, was always the the key principle to, to get in the best people um, and especially people that are like-minded and that click very easy together and um, can form a team very, very quickly. And um, and over time, I of, of course met a lot of lot of people from from different from different sectors, um, not only uh, engineers, um, also kind of like in, in all areas of, of a business. And um, in the end, with uh, with Unstoppable, we managed pretty well to get like a in like a very short time, really really cool people into the company that like started clicking and building a culture, uh, kind of like from from the first day onward. So that we as founders were able to also delegate a lot of uh, responsibility because um, so what, what I also always find important is um, founders of course need to ramp things up in the very beginning but over time like especially when, when being a leader it's your responsibility to work in the future yeah so so kind of like right. and, uh, I think the 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 hard process for many founders is to separate from working in the in the present and kind of like doing doing everything yourself versus working in the future by delegating all the kind of like stuff that needs to be finished in the in the present by delegating it to to your to a team members and trusting them that they can do it the same way as you can do and and the things so that this 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 process is um, is more easy the better you know the people and uh, the better they are and um, most of the people that we hire are smarter than us yeah so they they know like their their topic and their field much better than we do and this makes it then very easy to de to delegate and to uh, also uh, empower them to to drive their mission inside the company and also make it make it theirs because um, of course we're the founders but um, for us, it's very important that the, the company is not only owned by us, it's also owned by each of the team members that we have in place. That's a really good point you make, because I've seen this come up a number of times, the whole subject around um, being able to let go and delegate. Um, it's a problem that I faced a few years ago, where you do everything yourself and you really not saying you know I thought I knew it all, but uh, when you can see yourself doing the work, you you know that there's you know if you make a mistake, it was your mistake. So there is that difficulty that I know that a lot of founders find in letting go and trusting someone else to do it. So, firstly, how do you overcome that? And uh, secondly what would you say 
is the best way to, to, to manage that as well. So like, you know, if you want to delegate, how do you keep that fine line of, I still want to be able to see what they're doing, but don't want to be micromanaging them at the same time? Yeah, so I think each manager has their their own way of of, of doing things, and uh, so there, I think naturally there are people who do more micromanagement, and there are people who do less micromanagement. I'm probably on the very extreme side of doing less micromanagement um, because I feel very comfortable, especially when I when I know the people very well or me we have worked together in the past, so that I that I'm really able to to let them go and also let them let them build their uh, build their ideas because also what i what i learned in engineering is um, there is like always whatever seven ways of building something yeah so whatever like to choose a certain architecture to whatever name everything and and so on and um, so this but usually all of these seven ways solve the problem like in a in a uh, like in a, in a feasible way yeah so so therefore um but if you kind of like force people to do your way, they're usually less motivated to, to do this. So there, so therefore, um, so I developed for myself kind of, yeah, like these these, these check marks that, um, so I want to know like what solutions are there. Um, so if like a, like a team member has a solution, um, which maybe is not mine, but where I still believe that that, that this can work, then I, I let let the person do this. And, uh, and that just, just install kind of like guide rails for something whatever it's not uh, so not not, not choose like uh, too many technologies and uh, kind of stay pragmatic and um kind of first build like a proof of concept and then then we can see how things turn out so that we can still change our mind like uh and, and fail fast and and cheap um so that's uh that's kind of like how how i do this so to set the guide rails to also name very clearly when I want to be involved. Yeah, so there's, uh, for example, like topics around security or so, so where I always want to to be involved and where I have like very like a more strong opinion. And uh, because this also then translates to you being a managing director and taking also legal responsibility. So um, yeah, so this is uh, kind of um, you you need to tell the people when you want to be involved. Um, and uh, if you have these, uh, these, these callbacks, when, when they, they know like, okay, so now I need to, I need to inform. And then you have like an ad hoc meeting that's, uh, that works pretty well. Yeah, I really like that. It's a very, very good point to analyze that if you don't allow them to do it in their way, they'll be dem- demotivated. I didn't really look at it like that, but it makes total sense for sure. How do you make sure that they're able to do it their way, but also make sure that the way they are doing it is efficient, for example? Yeah, so, so, so this, uh, this, of course, uh, requires some, um, some observation. Um, and um, so, for example, in, in Unstoppable, we, uh, we work with um, like very short iterations. And um, so we have like a like a ongoing roadmap um, what we wanted want to build but it's more like on a on an epic space so that um, so that we plan it like every every three months um so that we know like what are the topics we want to work on um and in like the consequence like of each of these planning cycles there needs to be a release and um and in the end so if we figure out okay so the uh, like the feature is too big or we need to split it up and we or we need to involve other teams then we can kind of um, adjust and um, and uh, then weave in and uh, and say like okay so is this working the, uh, is this going the right direction or do we need to change something um, and uh, and of course there's uh, there's always also like a like a form of delegation so I um, have a have an amazing uh, kind of tech lead um, our director engineering in, in the company is, uh, is an amazing person um, that I also know from from many projects from from the past and um, so we kind of split up our our role especially on on the on the technical part that I'm more like on the future so kind of like giving giving a certain direction but also um, taking responsibilities in, in running the whole company and um, and yeah for example now kicking off this this bank project and being kind of the the uh, whatever entrepreneur in residence uh, building building this up um, on on the side 
and there um but yeah so but there's like always then somebody who's then also like close to the present being able to to observe and to react if something if something uh needs attention yeah it sounds like the key word there is trust trusting your, each other really um okay so you're almost two and a half years now deep with unstoppable finance has there been any hurdles along the way where you've like thought, oh my God, we've nearly, nearly lost it all? Yeah, so, so of course, so it's, it's two years now, more or less, um, like on, on the date. And um, so, of course, we have been surprised by uh, like the macroeconomic um, developments around us. So there, there was the, the Ukraine, Ukraine war um, starting up. Um, there has been um, also some shakeups in the in the blockchain industry. So with FTX and Celsius and um, and so on, um, which in the end also kind of like led to um, kind of at least and at least like, and also like seeing AI as the as the most important tech topic um, popping up in the meanwhile. So kind of like blockchain. Uh, got like less attention than it got whatever two or three years ago um that's definitely something that what we faced but still um we've we've seen these developments in the in the blockchain industry now for many years and it's it's always this like roller coaster kind of like that there's whatever like a new hype then there's uh, like the uh, the valley of sadness afterwards and like the the winter and then it's kind of like there's like the, the next technology coming up and kind of like triggering the, the next hype and um and always like in these like in these winter times um the whatever the the hype people got kind of like whatever uh flushed out um and whatever now jumping on ai and <laughs> whatever trying to uh to, to 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 fool people over there um with with their ideas um and and that's the that has always been very uh yeah giving like a, like a like a positive feeling if you realize that um there's only only builders in this in the space anymore and just like really intending to to build like the next the next wave of innovation um like on, on in a technology sense and i think this is now what's 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 going to happen so there's like less less activity on on the market side there's not so many new users coming into the space but there's a lot of uh, groundbreaking technology being built right now and um and that's uh Kind of uh, now also also us with building building this infrastructure with the with the wallet, um, but also with um, with the bank that uh, can become like a very important um, backend infrastructure for for many many companies in the industry. What's been the the highlight for you with your career at uh, Unstoppable Finance? I think the the highlight for for me personally is that um, that we get recognized so much from from the industry and get like a lot of um, that of feature. Um, and attention so that um, also uh, let's say the the traditional finance world and um, for example I got invited into like advisory group of Ministry of Finance in, in Germany so I'm, I'm, I'm part of like 40 people and there's like board members of uh, DAX companies and uh, and like the big big banks and insurance companies and so on it's like if um, if you get if you find a way into into such to such uh, groups um, this is also some implicit feedback that you do the right things and that you maybe hit the right tone and you have the uh, potentially also a very realistic view on the world and um, and people want to want to hear that and want to learn from from you i think so this uh, is very uh, yeah it gives gives me like a, a very 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 positive feeling um, that um, mm -hmm. that we get more that we gain more influence and that we're also able to to shape the, the world we're living in because um like the finance world has always been regulated will always be regulated and for for good reason and um but still kind of with the with the technology that we have at at our hands right now we can we can build something really groundbreaking and uh, and that's uh, that's uh, that's our mission absolutely fantastic and uh you know so just over two years now what's the what's the long-term goals from here on out then peter for, for ultimate 
Yeah, so for, for Ultimate, um, really becoming the, the digital companion for, for, for anyone when it comes to like finance and beyond. Um, so because with a wallet, it's, it's a very universal technology. Um, you, can manage your, you can manage your funds and um, you can manage access to, you, to, your, to your funds. Um, you can invest and um, there's a lot of projects now building um, like reward assets for um, like on, on top of the blockchain so that uh, people can whatever buy houses and um, real estate and um, stocks securities and, and uh, also like classical instruments that have uh, less volatility than, than cryptocurrencies. Um, but then also kind of like which what comes beyond DeFi, for example, in the Web3 that I have a digital identity that I uh, can log in through my wallet um, and uh, and authenticate certain transactions, get a rental car, and so on. It's, I think it's all these these use cases that will be built into into wallets in the in the future, and where like the wallet becomes your key uh, key app that that you're using uh, using multiple times every day to to do something in in the digital world, and um, and that's the that's the direction that we see for the for the long term for 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 wallet like Ultimate. Um, but yeah, so it's also about building bridges to that future, and um, on on that sense, we we see like stable coins as uh, I would say the the first three word asset that will ever hit the masses from from the crypto industry because it really enables people to do payments on a global global scale in in real time um, on like public infrastructure, and um, so we see stable coins and um, and the and the business that we're building up also as one very important bridge to really uh yeah kind of get to to do to the mass audience and bring the mass audience into into the space what gives you the the fire to still keep pursuing what you do day in day out because many would argue you know you've started up many successful business i'm sure you've done really well well why do you keep doing what you do well, um, how, how I always say, like in, in, in fun, so I, I can't do anything else. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but but, uh, but yeah, so it's uh, to, to me, it's, to me, it's, to me, to me, it's simply it's simply fun. So it's uh, it's like uh, like the like the the, the most the, the most interesting interesting thing like about uh, whatever creating success is really the way on of, of creating success so kind of like really building it and um, so when you when you start a new business and you don't have an idea you don't have people you don't have money you don't have a product you don't have ip so, so kind of like you you start from zero so this is like a very comfortable situation for me so this is, um, kind of like really taking these pragmatic decisions and just like bringing it on and um, and making making like a wheel out of all the tiny pieces that you have in front of you so this is um, this is what simply fun fun to me and um and it's uh it's like uh yeah and um and in the end as, as i'm i'm still interested in, in, in many things and uh, observe the world and try to find problems so um in the end uh, so this will keep you keep you building building things and um and that's uh, that's kind of the yeah so this this, this makes you makes you alive right yeah Absolutely. Stay curious for sure. Okay. So last question then, um, you know, there'll be many people listening to this within my network that are perhaps on the fence with an idea, but they just haven't got the courage yet to, to pursue it. What, what's one bit of advice you give to someone like that? Yeah. So, um, I, I gave that advice in, in the past, um, also to, to a few people and I know it's very, very, uh, yeah, so, 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 so very high level, but I, I always encourage people to just do it. Yeah, so it's a, it's a Nike claim, I know, but uh, but I think it's it's just so if people are fifty fifty about like, hey, should I do this? Uh, am I right? What if? And and so on. Um, you will never find out if you won't do it. Yeah. So so you have to you have to just do it and try it out and. Um, I for for myself um, always think like like in, in terms of when taking decisions. So when I take too much time for taking a decision, like the outcome already gets like worse, like because it's it's, it's like a whatever mathematical uh, linear uh, linear equation system. So where you um, kind of like one of the side conditions is like the more time you take on a decision, the worse it gets because kind of 
yeah so you you uh, lose time to to fail fail cheaper um, and faster and and usually also you don't come into the benefits of like really bringing it on and uh, and and building something up so therefore i i try to to take as many decisions kind of like as as fast as possible so if i feel confident i say like okay so i i'm i'm ending now like um, with my research and I, I can't get more information to kind of like lower the risk of, of being wrong. So then it's like about, okay, now taking the decision and, and doing it. And I think this is what, what people need to learn. It's like when having a dream and, uh, and being confident that, uh, that there's like a chance for that, then start, start, start doing it, talk to people, um, get in other opinions, make sure that it's not only you liking the idea under under the shower so it's uh, it's really about um, talking to others they won't steal your idea yeah so also like a like a very ongoing myth so like no it's, i've never heard about somebody stealing a, an idea from from somebody else um, because it's about the execution so talk to others get the feedback um, and um, make yourself like more confident for 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 your for your undertaking and um, if you if you get that support then really just do it absolutely 100 percent agree with that thank you very much peter really enjoyed hearing hearing all about your journey with uh, unstoppable finance and looking to forward to to seeing where you where you take it next thanks uh, so much for inviting me it was was big fun my pleasure peter thanks for listening to this episode of startup stories I hope you enjoyed hearing from our guests and learning more about their journey in the startup world. I'll be back soon with another exciting episode featuring a new guest. So make sure to subscribe to Startup Stories so you never miss an episode. Also, don't forget to follow me on social media for updates and additional content. And if you have any suggestions for guests or topics you'd like to hear about, please reach out to me. And as always, I appreciate your support and feedback. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.